Two horrible incidents took place last month. The first was in Boston on April 15th when three people were killed and dozens were wounded in a bombing incident. The subsequent chase of the bombers resulted in the shooting death of a fourth victim who was a university security officer. The second incident took place just two days later in a small Texas community called West. There was an explosion in a fertilizer plant that killed 15 people, injured nearly 200, and leveled or made uninhabitable more than 150 houses and buildings. Two events in one week in April. What do you know about the Boston bombers? Well, you know the names of two Chechen brothers, Dokar and uh, Tamerlan. Immediately after they were identified, literally immediately, American reporters were on their way to Russia, hounded their mother and their father and their uncle for details of their lives. Tamerlan was killed in a gun battle with the police. Dokar was injured and hospitalized and placed under arrest. Reporters filled hours and hours of broadcast time, even though they had relatively few details to add. We know they used pressure cookers. We know that they put nails and metal balls into the pressure cookers. We know that they went to a fireworks store to get gunpowder and fuses. We've seen dozens of photos of them walking through the streets of Boston, carrying the bombs in backpacks and wearing ball caps and appearing satisfied with the mayhem they created. We've gone through hours and hours of hand wringing about which mosque they attended in Boston, where they traveled to, speculated about how they became radicalized. We've heard about what websites they visited. We've heard interviews with their college roommates. We know about Tamerlan's ex-wife, his boxing career. We know about Dokar's penchant for smoking pot. We've listened to debates about whether this was domestic or foreign terrorism or if it was just two crazy people creating mayhem. We've heard endless speculation about what caused them to become so radical. Should Dokar get the death penalty? Should he be negotiated with for information? What help might they have gotten from their mother or from friends in the Boston area? Now, it was a horrible event, and, and in that sense, it was indisputably newsworthy to a degree. But if what these two deranged young men wanted was to cause disruption and draw attention to themselves, well, they've been quite successful with the help of the media. Now, you know where I'm going with this. What do we know about what caused the explosion in West Texas? There were five times as many people killed and injured. More homes and businesses were destroyed in Texas. Do you know who owned that fertilizer plant? Do you know where the owner of the fertilizer plant went to church? Do you know what chemicals exploded and why? Now, you may be thinking, now, Boston was an intentional act of terrorism, the other was an accident. And to a degree, that would be right. But let me tell you a little bit about the accident. The fertilizer plant was operating in a residential area, which is dangerous on the face of it. I mean, that's a, a bad decision on the face of it. But if you're going to do that, you've got to take extra precautions, right? But no safety inspection had been done at that fertilizer plant since 1985, 1985, 28 years. And the last time it was inspected, they found out that they did not properly store anhydrous ammonia, which is very explosive. So the EPA fined them $30. The plant was licensed to store no more than 24 tons of anhydrous ammonia. But at the time of the explosion, they had more than twice that amount and had never said anything about that to anyone. 50 tons. They also had ammonium nitrate, which they were not licensed to have, which is extremely explosive. So much so that if you have as much as 400 pounds of ammonium nitrate, you have to register with the Homeland Security Agency and let them know where it is and how you are securing it. Fortunately, the plant didn't have 400 pounds. 
They did, however, have 270 tons, 270 tons of illegally stored ammonia. They did not have even a home security system camera system. They did not have guards. Now, you may know that anhydrous ammonia is part of what's used to make methamphetamine, so they had thefts all the time. A lot of methamphetamine, even in our area, comes out of Texas, and it comes because places like this have tons of stuff they don't even uh, keep track of and have no security around. The people who died in the blast were all first responders. They were volunteer firemen and EMS workers who rushed in to put out a fire at a place where no one lived. None of the managers or owners who knew that they had 300 tons of explosives in a building that was on fire warned the firemen not to run into a bomb site. No warning was given. So yeah, the Boston bombers were crazy, murdering psychopaths whose profile and motivations are endlessly interesting as we try to understand how these things happen. But why is the media silent about the West Texas tragedy? And once you know what happened there, do you still think it was an accident? Why do the owners of a plant who operate unsafely for the cause of profit, why does that slip below our collective awareness? Now let me let you stew on that for a minute. We have a kind of an odd story before us from the book of Acts today in which Paul and Silas are on a preaching tour and they are being bothered by a young slave girl whom the text says was possessed by a demon. Now let me just say, in Paul's authentic letters, he never mentions exercising demons. Paul, and if Paul had ever done something really cool like that, Paul would be the first person to tell you about it. So the book of Acts is written 50, 100 years after Paul's dead, and, and the guy that wrote it is trying to make Paul look really good. So he's sort of padding his resume. You know how this works. So he's telling stories about Paul that, that were made up. But in the story, in the narrative, even still, it doesn't read all that complimentary to Paul because it doesn't say that he took sympathy on the girl for being a slave and it doesn't say that he took sympathy on her because she was possessed with a demon it says she was bothering him which is a dangerous thing to do to Paul so he turns around and he exercises this demon so what interests me about the story is not really the demon part what interests me is that Paul and Silas were preaching and nobody cared Nobody bothered Paul and Silas. They, they can preach all they want to. When did they get in trouble? They got in trouble when they interrupted the profit that this young girl's owners made by exploiting this scam to do fortune telling. They got in trouble when they interrupted capitalism, when they interrupted profit. And once they did that, regardless of what they've been preaching, they were drawn, and it even says, into the marketplace. I don't know, it could have been a courthouse, but we all know, where's the real holy temple in Springfield, Missouri? Do you think it's here? Is it the Catholic Cathedral on Jefferson? Isn't it really the Battlefield Mall? Isn't that our holy shrine in, in our culture? Because religion is one thing. And it's okay if you want it. You know, you can have all the religion you want. But when it interferes with business, now that's something different. In fact, when Paul disturbed the marketplace, when he cut into their despicable money-making scheme, they dragged him into public, stripped him, beat him, and then by court order had him flogged and thrown into prison and locked into the stocks. Trying to convert people is not interesting. You know, your religion, your pie-in-the-sky stuff, do whatever you want to do. But religion for religion's sake is it gets a pass. But what's really sacred, what's really, really important, is not ideology, it's money. They were willing to flog the hide off of Paul and Silas for getting in the way of making money 
because profit can cover a multitude of sins. Now, I'm not saying that what the Boston bombers did is in any way excusable or even understandable. It was a horrible event. But it was about one-third as horrible as what happened in Texas. But we will immediately give a pass to people getting killed in the process of someone who's wealthy and making money. And we will not give a pass to people who have an ideology that hurts us. You've all heard the saying about the media that if it bleeds, it leads. We tend to follow news in the same way that people who stare at a car wreck. So why would the media obsess about a story in which four people died hours and hours and hours for weeks and ignore an incident in which 15 people died? Now, part of it is undoubtedly the difference that we place in uh, someone dying on the East Coast and someone dying in Texas. I mean, you just got to see that, you know, we'll talk about American deaths. We don't talk about foreign deaths. You know, a bunch of people get killed in a clothing manufacturing plant in, in uh, India or in the East. That's just not nearly as interesting as deaths in the United States. But even within the United States, an East Coast death is more important than a Texas death. I mean, that's just kind of the way the media works. But more than that, the differences were that one was an ideology perpetrated by foreign-born people, and the other was an accident in the process of doing business. Now, it was making money in a way that people involved knew was extremely dangerous for the people who lived around the plant, the people who worked there, and even dangerous for the meth heads that would break in at night to steal anhydrous ammonia so that they could make another batch of meth. But our corporate-owned media doesn't like to talk about casualty counts that come from greed, that come from capitalism run amok. Why is it only here that you ever hear anything about the, the part of Walmart's uh, stock that is produced by slaves? Why isn't that ever discussed in the media? The American public has been given so little information about these incidents that most of us have yet to form an opinion about it. And our government is seriously discussing at this time, because of the uh, Boston bombing, that we just might not give any more student visas to students coming from Muslim countries. That, that we won't even discuss how deregulation and cutbacks from industrial safety inspectors made this disaster in Texas possible. In fact, Texas has been advertising the fact that they have fewer restrictions, regulations than most states since the explosion in West Texas to encourage manufacturing to come to their state. As if to say, look, you can come down here and get cheap workers, no inspections, kill them all, and nothing happens. Nothing at all. It is sadly true in our present day that most terrorists, what the media calls terrorists, are Muslims. Unless, of course, you count what is done by formal armies against civilian populations as terrorism. If you call that terrorism, just killing innocent civilians through military force, then the emphasis or the number of terrorist acts shifts from Muslims in the direction of Israel and the United States. So we're not likely to ever hear our media calling killing innocent civilians by military action terrorism. And there are no interviews being given at the morgue uh, where the victims of drone strikes are. The media ought to be talking about what happened in the Exxon oil spill in, in Arkansas, but they're not. The media ought to be thinking about this absurd Monsanto protection bill that President Obama signed recently that absolves Monsanto in advance, before any legal action is, has been filed, absolves them in advance from any injuries caused by their frankenfoods. And the media ought to be talking about how deregulation has left even the businesses that handle the stuff that dangerous drugs are made out of and that bombs are made out of without any accountability. Flooding our southern states with cheap methamphetamine and sometimes blowing up little towns. The corporate media won't touch these stories because they are part and parcel of the same profit motive. For what it's worth, I learned most of what I know about the Texas explosion from Russian television. 
But more importantly is that the mainstream church is not that different than the corporate media. The church has a long and sordid history of hiding its pedophiles and embezzlers to protect their income stream and does not take on issues that affect the marketplace because the mainstream church and the corporate media and corporations are cut from the same piece of cloth. Money is the only really sacred thing they know. And if we don't want to be just like them, then we have to be willing to cast the demons out of the marketplace knowing all the while that we're going to stay in a certain amount of trouble for doing that. Now, I don't have a convenient passage of scripture to quote about that, so I will quote the great American philosopher Mark Twain, who said that sometimes the highest compliment a man can be paid is by being hated by the right people. If the institutions that create poverty endanger their workers and the people around them and try to make people disposable and profit sacred want to drag us into the public square and flog us, then I'm willing to suffer the compliment of being despised by their ilk because I sure don't want them to think that they can buy my silence or that I am their friend. We've decided to follow Jesus rather than the church, and I am so relieved that that's true. We will then always be found among the poor and the powerless and the people who typically die in silence, but they will not die in silence while this microphone is alive. Amen. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.